Sempre un amabile, leggiadro viso, in pianto e riso, e ben La donna è morti, qua più malo è netto, nuca bacia in tu, e di penessie. Frank Castle, The Punisher. He is vengeance. He is the knight. No, wait, that's Batman. He's the lethal protector? Wait, that's Venom? Alright, kinda thought he had more aliases and titles than just The Punisher. But whatever, I think we're all somewhat familiar with the antics of Frank Castle. He's an ex-marine whose life was changed forever when his family was killed by the mob, sending him spiraling down a dark path that would create the brutal, criminal slaughtering anti-hero we all know and love. Though every now and then they'd try to retool Frank to questionable results, like when he became a supernatural angel of vengeance, or a Frankenstein, or when he went to Riverdale and had to protect Archie Andrews. Besides comic books, Frank Castle isn't a stranger to popping up in other media. In fact, the first time I learned about the Punisher was when he showed up during a few episodes of Spider-Man the Animated Series, which is pretty fitting considering he made his comics debut in Amazing Spider-Man number 129. Despite the fact he was severely sanitized for a kid's cartoon, I got the feeling there was something much more darker about him. The way he interacted with criminals and how they portrayed his backstory was enough to hint at his more bloodthirsty origins. I also thought his outfit on the show was pretty cool, though the headband felt a little too much. Besides the cartoon, The Punisher has had a few movies over the years. There's the terrible Dolph Lundgren one. I tried to watch it, but it was just so boring, and it weirdly feels like a low-budget version of Dolph Lundgren's other movie, Showdown in Little Tokyo. Watch that instead. He teams up with Brandon Lee to stop the Yakuza, who are led by Shang Tsung. Next, we got the absolutely incredible 2004 Punisher movie, with Thomas Jane as Frank Castle, and John Travolta of all people playing the villain Howard Saint. It was more faithful to the source material, the movie specifically based off of Garth Ennis' Welcome Back Frank storyline, one of if not the most definitive Punisher storyline, as it worked to fix Frank and bring him back to the basics, retconning all that weird angel stuff he had done before. While I like John Bernthal as the most recent Punisher, Thomas Jane still feels like the definitive version of the character to me. He brought this complex and nuanced take to the character, capturing both the vengeful and tormented side to Frank Castle, even adding some vulnerability and empathy to him, showing that he was much more than your stereotypical 80s anti-hero. The action, the solid cast, and the really good instrumental theme they use for Frank makes it one of my all-time favorite action movies especially the unrated version. Oh, and then there was the 2008 Punisher Warzone movie that no one seems to remember. I've never seen it, so I can't speak to its quality. But considering it rebooted the Punisher instead of being a direct sequel to the 2004 movie, and recast Thomas Jane, I don't imagine it was great. And of course, we got Punisher video games. He hasn't had many of them, but does have a decent track record of good games. You got The Punisher for NES, one of the better games published by our friends at Laughing Joking Numbnuts, the seriously good Punisher arcade game by Capcom. I swear, they never miss when it comes to beat em ups. And of course, the one I'm here to talk about today, 2005's The Punisher, which was developed by the crew behind Saints Row, Volition. Interestingly, The Punisher almost feels like a prototype for the Saints Row games, as it shares a lot of gameplay mechanics with the series, but I'll get into that in a bit. Despite the fact that it was released so close to the movie, and brings on Thomas Jane to reprise his role as Frank Castle. How many people have you killed in the last few weeks? Not sure. There were a lot of explosions. <laughs> this isn't your typical movie licensed tie-in game. While it does borrow some aspects from the movie, and adapts some things from Welcome Back Frank, it's mostly its own original story with Garth Ennis brought on board to write it. The game begins with Frank finishing off the Yakuza at their HQ, before calmly stepping outside and allowing the police to arrest him. In an interrogation room on Rikers Island, he'll be interviewed by Lieutenant Molly Richtofen 
and Detective Martin Soap. Frank will then recall the series of events that led him to taking down the Yakuza, and why he let himself get arrested, with these flashbacks serving as the bulk of the game's story and levels. The game is primarily a third-person shooter, and will have Frank shooting his way through exotic places like the local crack house, a bar filled with mobsters, the Central Park Zoo, and even Stark Industries. Before beginning each mission, you'll start off in Frank's apartment, which I just love the work and detail they put into. Showing off his weapon armory, newspaper clips from his antics, and photos of criminals he's after and has killed. Once you're ready to start a mission, you'll hear a brief snippet from Frank discussing why he traveled to a certain location, and will have the option to customize your loadout before beginning. You're only able to bring two guns with you, a smaller sidearm like a pistol or a machine gun, and a bigger firearm like an assault rifle or a shotgun. Weapon choices are limited at first, but you'll unlock more as you complete levels and can pick up guns off of any enemy you kill. There are melee weapons, but they have limited use and you can only use them for a quick kill or just toss them at an enemy. Useful if there's only one guy in the room who hasn't spotted you, but otherwise you're better off just pumping every scumbag you see full of lead. Shooting feels exactly like it does in Saints Row, lacking auto-aim and instead using manual aim with the target reticle in the center of the screen. You can also use focused aim which will zoom in closer and let you target body parts easier. Useful for enemies who are farther away or who have a hostage. As you take down criminals, you'll earn points for each one you kill, getting a bonus score for things like headshots, and earning a combo multiplier for every enemy you take out without getting shot. Shooting isn't all there is to it though, as that leads us to what gave the game so much notoriety back in the day, executions. Getting up close to a criminal, you can instantly trigger an auto kill that takes them out in a gory way. Though, there's also the option to take them as a human shield, which trust me, you're going to need a lot in the later levels. But if you choose not to use them as a meat shield, you can interrogate them instead, by choking them, punching their face in, threatening them with a gun, or smashing their face into an object. The game is kind enough to mark off enemies who have vital information with a white skull, but technically you can interrogate any enemy. Interrogating them will start a minigame where you'll move the analog stick either up or down, in order to raise the criminal's stress meter. You need to keep their stress within this yellow segment for 3 seconds in order to break them and get the information you need. Do it successfully and they'll provide a tip about your target, reveal the location of weapons in the level, or sometimes they'll offer to distract their group of friends for you. This is also the only way you can heal Frank, as there are no med kits or usable items to get his health back. On top of the standard 4 interrogation methods, dotted throughout the levels are little white spots marked with Punisher symbols where you can perform a special interrogation. This lets you use the environment to interrogate someone, like threatening to throw a guy out the window, using a buzzsaw on him, or playing chicken with a rhino. These special interrogations will award more points and usually return a larger amount of health if pulled off successfully. If you fail an interrogation, usually by killing the guy you're intimidating, you'll lose points instead, and get treated to a gory scene of the guy's death. Well, not really as the game had to censor the execution kills before release, otherwise it would be rated adults only and wouldn't be allowed on shelves for most retailers. They just slap a black and white filter during the execution, and with certain ones they'll pan the camera away to avoid showing it, though if you have the game on PC, you can download a patch that removes the censorship. It's funny, these executions are so tame by today's standards. If the game ever got a remaster or re-release, they wouldn't have to censor a thing. Since failing an execution can cost you vital info, and takes points off your score, most players would probably end up avoiding execution kills. Though the game does make up for it with special executions. Marked with a gold Punisher logo, you can drag an enemy up to a spot and kill them in a gory fashion for an extra amount of points. Interrogations are a fun novelty, though some of them can feel janky, as it's hard to gauge how soft or hard you should move the analog stick, with some breaking points so tiny. It's close to impossible to maintain for 3 seconds with the sensitive controls, and some have a margin of error so small, you might instantly kill someone instead. Along with racking up points, for every kill that Frank gets, you'll fill up a blue meter below his health that lets you activate slaughter mode. It's basically the rage mode you've seen in dozens of other games, making Frank invulnerable for a time, letting him throw knives at enemies, landing gory or quick kills, and also refilling his health a little bit. It's somewhat balanced as while Frank is invulnerable, 
any hits he takes from enemies will cause slaughter mode to run out faster and cut down on his health recovery. Along with criminals, there will be several civilians and levels trying to run and hide from all the danger. Thankfully, Frank can't kill any civilians, so you don't have to worry about showing too much restraint or accidentally killing a friend when entering a room. Though, enemies will use them as human shields, and if you take too long to save them, the person who grabbed them will blow their heads off. While you won't fail a level if you don't save them, you do miss out on bonus points, as well as potential useful hints. For example, this one area in the zoo has a couple goons about to kill a guard. If you save him in time, he'll warn you about an upcoming trap and tell you a safer route to take. Now these points I've been talking about do serve more of a purpose than just a high score and a medal at the end of a level, as you can spend them on upgrades for Frank. Increasing the defense of his body armor, the accuracy of his guns, ammo capacity, grenade capacity, a longer slaughter mode, attachments for weapons, and the ability to recover health just by killing an enemy. Though that one runs really expensive, so unless you're replaying levels to grind for points, you're not going to afford it till the end of the game. Completing a level with a high score will also net you some unlockables like concept art, comic book covers, costumes, and trailers for the Punisher movie. Overall, I'd say the gameplay is pretty solid, if a bit repetitive as the game doesn't really introduce many new elements to keep things fresh. At most, it's just the different executions, saving different hostages, and teaming up with other Marvel characters. The first to show up will be Black Widow. What the hell are you doing here, Castle? You're welcome. I let them capture me, you fool. Why? A stolen Russian nuke is coming in by freighter tonight. I'm taking it back. Why are you here? Just hosing down the docks. Man, I'd completely forgotten she used to have a Russian accent. 13 years of Scarlett Johansson playing her with a normal American accent must have wiped it from my mind. Along with the Russian femme fatale, we also got the head of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury. You I don't need. Why the hell are you here? Sightseeing. What is S.H.I.E.L.D. doing here? The same thing you are. Trying to stop a madman. Your squad looks a little short, team up. But try not to shoot me in the back. Let's go! Oh yeah, I also forgot that Nick Fury was a white guy in the comics. Like, yeah, I know Samuel Jackson's version is based on the ultimate version of Nick Fury. Or actually, I think it's the other way around, with the character being based on his appearance. But you never see them use the classic design anymore in new media and advertising. Though I think both versions of the character now exist in the main Earth-616 Marvel Universe with the Sam Jackson version being Nick Fury Jr. and the son of the original Nick Fury? I don't know, I fell off reading Marvel comics hard, so feel free to correct me in the comments if any of that is wrong. And while they don't actually help you through a mission exactly, we do get cameos from Matt Murdock and Iron Man. Man, before Phase 4 of the MCU soured me on the whole shared universe thing, I used to love superhero team-ups. As a kid, it was so cool to see Spider-Man teaming up with Iron Man, the X-Men, or the Fantastic Four. Also, despite the fact that most of the superhero community hates his guts, I've always really liked the dynamic the Punisher has with other heroes. For example, despite the fact they both sit on opposite sides of the morality scale, I've always really liked his relationship with Spider-Man, as he tends to show Peter respect as a hero, and he isn't constantly shitting on the guy like the editors at Marvel Comics for some reason. Just let Peter and Mary Jane get married again. What the hell, guys? I also liked how he saved Spider-Man from near death when he was attacked by pro-registration villains during Civil War. Iconic panel right there. Then there's his whole relationship with Captain America for that matter, showing an immense amount of respect for Steve Rogers, what with both being war veterans fighting for their country, both coming from poor immigrant families, and Captain America basically inspiring Frank to enlist and fight in Vietnam. Or Desert Storm, or the Iraq War, or whatever war he's been retconned to be a part of now. Hell, he idolizes the guy so much that during Civil War, Frank refused to raise a hand against Cap as he was whooping his ass for killing two villains on his team. It's those relationships that Frank has that really shows he's a lot more than a one-man murder machine, and is a much more complex and tragic figure. You don't really get much of that in this game, outside of some PTSD flashbacks to the death of his family, but oh well. Get the fuck out of the road, asshole! New York City. 
forget the things you've heard about the place. About the new New York. Hell's Kitchen is called Clinton. Park full of tourists. But it's not real. The old New York is waiting just below the surface. There's nothing to help you when the darkness falls. You're laid open so the world can rummage in your guts. Just because the mayor chased away the monsters, chased them to Brooklyn and the Bronx, don't think this place has changed. Not in its heart. Not where it lives. Do not fall in New York City. No one's gonna catch you. Returning to the story, after Frank lets himself get arrested and ends up in Rikers, he starts explaining the series of events that brought him here. First, he goes into how he cleaned out his local crack house, killing the lead drug dealer played by Steve Bloom. It might come off as insignificant at first, just serving as your usual tutorial level, but it's what happens at the end that kicks off the plot, as after dropping the dealer onto the pavement, an unseen figure in a car will try to run over Frank before driving off. Unable to let the half-assed attempt on his life go, and suspecting something bigger at play, Castle will end up tracking the car to a chop shop. After talking to the shop's owner, Carlo Duca, we find out the operation is run by the Ganucci crime family. Run by Ma Ganucci, the mobsters would serve as the primary antagonist to welcome back Frank, with the Punisher killing her sons, her mercenaries, her soldiers, and eventually Ma. Twice. The first third of the game more or less works as a retelling of the events of that comic storyline, with Frank picking off members of the family. The first stop will be Lucky's Bar, where Frank will take care of Bobby Ganucci. Ma will try getting revenge by having her hired cybernetic mercenary, and Wesker knockoff, Bushwhacker, kidnap Frank's neighbor Joan and hold her hostage at the Central Park Zoo. After saving her, Frank will sneak into Bobby's funeral to kill everyone in attendance, with his eyes set on Eddie Ganucci and Ma. Ma ends up escaping, but we do get an annoying boss battle with Eddie, where he'll run around an attic taking shots at Frank. It's not hard, even with him occasionally summoning some of his goons for support. It just takes forever, as Eddie refuses to sit still. It wasn't until he bugged and got stuck on a wall that I could end the fight and send him off to see his brother. Any last words, Eddie? My ma will never rest until you're dead! You unlock two levels after this and have the choice on which to do next. One is to go after Ma to her estate. The other is to interrupt her drug business by heading to the harbor controlled by a Russian syndicate. I went with the harbor first, where I teamed up with Black Widow, who was running a separate investigation into the Russians who may have gotten their hands on a nuke. She's a huge help here, as she can't die, is pretty accurate with her guns, and can keep aggro off Frank, so I can heal by interrogating someone or sneak up on another guy. After destroying a boat with a crane, the pair will get separated, and Frank will get in a boss fight with a tank. And it's... Eh? Yeah, not tough, just long, and very boring. Sorry, they wouldn't wait. The nuclear device also will not wait. There are two Russian freighters arriving tomorrow night. The device is on one of them, which I do not know. One ship for each of us. You investigate the Igor Baltiski. I will take the Red Guardian. Why do I get the feeling that Frank is going to be the lucky one to find the nuke first? This leads us to the Ganucci estate to finish off Ma. First killing the remaining soldier she has left, before fighting Bushwhacker in a boss battle. He's less annoying than Eddie, and he's supposed to have a weakness to strong light, according to some goon I interrogated. But the flash grenades I throw at him do nothing. I thought it was bugged, but I didn't realize I was supposed to shoot off his sunglasses first. Then it would work. Whoops. Oh well. Still an easy fight. That should do it. 
You bastard! What are you doing? Disarming you. After the mansion catches on fire, Frank will have to race around to find Ma before the place burns down, treating the old bag to a similar death to her son. Got what I came for. Time to leave. Funny, but not as cool as in the comic when he feeds her to polar bears at the zoo and then she miraculously manages to survive without any limbs. So Frank comes back to finish the job and tosses her ass back into her burning house. Seeing as they had to censor this game already, it was probably way too gruesome to include in the game. Since all the Ganuchis are dead now, it doesn't look like we've quite figured out the mystery of the guy who tried to kill Frank. But that'll have to wait, as we got some Russians with a nuclear warhead we gotta stop. Boarding the Igor Batalsky freighter, I probably mispronounced that, Frank shoots his way through commie scum and reminds them why America won the Cold War. Unfortunately, it seems the nuke was already unloaded, but we do free some women who are being held captive, and find out that some General Kriegoff is the one planning to attack the US. Before he can head off to the mercenary base where the General and his nuke is located, Frank decides to head back to his place to prepare. Damn, Joan must have made another batch of cookies. Big boy. Like the Ganucci family, the Russian also comes from Welcome Back Frank, where he's basically the same as he's portrayed here. Only difference is Ma hired him to kill Frank and not General Krikov. It's another boss fight, and it seriously sucks ass. Like, I wasn't expecting it to be the epic fight we got with Thomas Jane and Kevin Nash in the movie, but it feels less like a fight and more of an extended QTE sequence. Since you can't throw a punch in this game, and Frank won't use any of the guns in his apartment for some reason, you instead have to bait the Russian into using his ground pound attack, then hop onto his back and guide him over to gold execution icons to use the environment to attack him, before he breaks free and pushes the fight to the next stage. Honestly, a two minute cutscene fight of them would have been way more enjoyable. Once Frank's managed to turn the tide of the fight, he'll treat the Russian to his favorite execution move. That's not good. Once he's healed up, Frank will go after the general to repay the favor of sending his dim-witted mercenary after him. General Krikov's base of operations is on Grand Nixon Island, which I thought was off the coast of New York but I guess not considering it's a tropical jungle island, so maybe it's somewhere around Florida instead. Halfway through, Nick Fury and S.H.I.E.L.D. will show up, as like Frank, they're there to stop America from getting nuked. Admittedly, Frank should probably just leave it to them, but considering his military service, and more importantly, that he's a goddamn American, it makes sense for him to stick around and work for Fury. This level overall is frustrating and feels like it goes on forever. First, all the mercenaries you're fighting are rocking some durable body armor, so you need to aim for headshots to drop them fast and save ammo. Next, there are a few parts where you have to get past the guy manning a turret, and due to its armor, it's impossible to shoot the guy directly. So you either have to attack him from the side and hope he doesn't turn to hit you, or chuck a grenade at him and hope you don't miss. That's assuming you have any grenades, of course as they don't appear often and some can only be found if you interrogate the right guys and don't kill them. Then there's this stupid section where Frank is riding a slow moving gondola and has to use a sniper rifle Nick Fury gave him to kill anyone shooting at the thing. 
You have to drop the guys shooting at you fast and constantly scan the area for anyone still firing. But due to the color of the scope, it can be easy to miss someone and get shot down. And then, in one last punch in the cock, it's another awful boss battle. Kreekoff! It's clobbering time! Favorite saying of Ting, Rockman of the Fantastic Four, big superhero in Russia. Can it! The Punisher's coming! You handle him while I arm the nuke! Okie dokie, boss. The Russian is on the case. And don't screw up again, or I'll have your head ripped off and mounted on my wall! No! This time the Russian finishes the job. This fight is a hundred times worse than the last one with the Russian, as even though we can use guns now, I guess this asshole is bulletproof because you'll do zero damage to him with your bullets. Like what is he, a cyborg now? Okay, I know he does become a cyborg in the comics, and then later a woman for some reason. No comment. But there's nothing really hinting or explaining at that at all here. Instead, the only way to hurt him is to wait for him to run to a barrel, where he'll ignite it and then try tossing it at Frank. You have to quickly aim and blow the barrel as he holds it overhead to damage him, then do it all over again. All the while, you still have to fight off soldiers that will still spawn in the arena. Then, when you get him down to about half health, he'll be covered in flames and jump down to your level to try and punch you to death. Now, you have to lure him near a barrel, bait him into attacking you, dodge so he hits the barrel, and then get out of there before it blows in order to damage him. Again, while you're still being shot at by soldiers, it's such a tedious and frustrating fight that takes so goddamn long to get through. Especially if you get hurt badly and need to heal. As you have to get far away enough from the Russian to grab a goon to interrogate successfully to heal yourself. And it won't be for much. It's easily the worst boss fight in the entire game. And while I wouldn't say they get better exactly, the rest of the boss fights are nowhere near as frustrating as this one. Once the Russian Human Torch is put down for good, Frank will take down the general and we get a cool cutscene of him escaping with Nick Fury. believe he let me live. Man, sure hope there weren't any S.H.I.E.L.D. agents left on the island. Returning to the plot of who tried to kill Frank, we continue moving up the ranks of crime. As it turns out, the Ganucci's and the Russians were under the control of Wilson Fisk. You know the routine by now. Go to his place of business, fuck shit up, and kill everyone who works for him. Partway through, we got another boss battle. This time with Bullseye. Also voiced by Steve Bloom. <laughs> Thought you'd never get here, Castle. Looking for someone. Where's Kingpin, Bullseye? The big guy can't see you now, Castle. But I've made room for you in my schedule. Get out of the way. Or what? You'll scowl me to death? I don't miss, you know. Too bad you can't say the same. Hard to miss a guy with a target on his forehead. 
So this is more of a recurring boss battle that happens throughout the level. As once you do enough damage to Bullseye, he'll run off and then you'll have to fight him again in a different area further in. He's nowhere near as frustrating as the Russian. As while he'll cartwheel around and can only be damaged by headshots and explosives, he's still easy to hit and it's still simple to wear his health down if you have steady aim. Also, Bullseye ended up bugging out on me in our final fight, which made it easy to finish him off and continue the running gag of Frank just tossing people out the window. <laughs> and we also come face to face with the big man himself, with Frank hitting the kingpin with this zinger. So, Bullseye failed me again. Tossed him out the window. You're planning the same fate for me? No, you would have to roll. Also, whoops. Looks like whoever tried to kill Frank sent him after Fisk as a distraction and to weaken the competition. Right on cue, said group ambush and attack Fisk Industries. It's the Yakuza group known as the Eternal Sun. After fighting them off and escaping, Frank will later meet up with an informant he has who tells him the identity of the guy manipulating things. It's a new player in town named Jigsaw, who has some history with Frank and hates him for fucking up his face. Currently, he's managed to become the top lieutenant in the Eternal Sun, working as the right-hand man to its leader, Takagi. Welp, I guess we know the next criminal organization we're going to destroy. Briefly flashing back to the present, we get a cameo from Matt Murdock, again voiced by Steve Bloom. Hold it right there. Anything my client has said without his attorney present is inadmissible. Mr. Castle, don't say another word. Too late, Murdock. Go home. Mr. Castle, as your attorney, I strongly- I don't need a lawyer. You're fired. Sorry if it seems random that I keep bringing it up. I have zero issues with Steve Bloom as a voice actor. He's voiced some of the most iconic anime characters like Spike Spiegel, Mugen, Gilmon, and Wolverine. It's just really distracting to hear him voice most of the bosses and like 70% of the game's cast. Seeing as they had Nolan North, James Arnold Taylor, and Fred Tatatsiori as part of the cast, I think it would have been better to have some of these other major characters voiced by them too, instead of putting them all on Steve. The next two levels have Frank trying to stop the Eternal Sun, first returning to the docks to stop them from taking it from the remaining Russians, then to a meatpacking plant controlled by the Gnuchis. Afterwards, Frank's informant will tell him Jigsaw's true identity, John Saint, son of Howard Saint from the movie. You know, this guy. Don't leave me like this. You don't leave me like this. As it turns out, that claymore he left him holding didn't blow him to bits, and instead flung him through a window and shredded his face. Huh. It's kind of stupid, but it's actually a pretty interesting twist. Like I brought up near the beginning, this game is a weird mix of elements from the comics, the movie, and with some original ideas peppered in. So while it kind of mucks things up with continuity, the game works as a pseudo-sequel to the movie. Uh, what could have been if they did a true sequel instead of a reboot with Warzone? Our snitch isn't done spilling his guts though. As it turns out, Frank's pushback against the Eternal Sun has caused some internal strife within the group with Takagi losing favor with his own men and Jigsaw taking more and more control. To ensure total domination of the group and to have something powerful to kill Frank with, Jigsaw is planning to hit Stark Industries in order to steal Iron Man tech. Since Castle and Stark aren't exactly best buddies, he'll need to covertly enter the facility, which he does by joining a tour group with his neighbor, Specker Dave. Ah yes. Joining a tour while wearing the iconic outfit you're known for. There's no way Tony Stark would recognize him. Hey look, a Half-Life reference. What was that, Dr. Freeman? Maybe the quantum physics group finally opened that extra dimensional portal. Extra dimensional aliens. Wonder what they look like. Right on cue, the Eternal Sun shows up to rick up the joint. Man, Tony's security sucks ass. Like dude, you developed some of the most powerful tech on the planet. A bunch of Yakuza storming the place is the equivalent of cavemen with clubs. 
trying to fight a modern military with guns. Does that make sense? It's a good metaphor, right? Analogy. Whatever. Iron Man does show up to put in the work to fight back, and his security does have Stark Tech weaponry, though somehow they still take heavy losses against the Yakuza. I don't know, maybe I'm being too harsh. Maybe it's just a sheer numbers kind of deal. Or Tony's hired guards are just incompetent at their job. As this cutscene demonstrates. Castle knew something. Find out what it was. Yes, sir. There was someone with Castle. Came on the tour with him and left with him. And? Well, sir, he stole some things from the labs. Paper clips, a hole punch, and some scraps of metal. Should I contact the police? I need a drink. The Eternal Sun did manage to get the tech they wanted, so Frank will head to the Takagi building to stop them and Jigsaw before he figures out how to use an Iron Man suit. And holy shit, fuck this place. It starts off okay, with Frank shooting his way through the usual cannon fodder, though the Eternal Sun does have some guys decked out in full suit body armor, which makes them impervious to damage unless you go for headshots, quick kills, or explosives. You can also use the flamethrower on them, but that thing sucks and has terrible range. So headshots and explosives are the better way to go. Before you can make it to Takagi, you have to grab one of his white armored troopers and walk him back to the elevator that leads up to him, using their retina to unlock the elevator. Simple enough, and the game spawns enough of these guys that if you accidentally kill one, or they get killed while you use them as a shield, you won't get screwed over. It's only the second half of the level after you've met Takagi that shit hits the fan. He'll explain that the remaining members of the Eternal Sun have abandoned him for Jigsaw. And before the guy could solidify his control, Takagi just called the cops on him and had him arrested. However, that's only a temporary setback. As the Eternal Sun plan to break him out once they're done with their old boss and Frank. Before they show up, the old man asks Castle to kill him with his samurai sword, promising his remaining loyal bodyguards won't try to kill him if he honors his dying wish. He's not bullshitting, by the way. As if you kill Tagagi in any other way but the sword, they'll pounce on you and wreck your shit. Killing him, his bodyguard babes take their own lives, leaving Frank all alone to fight off the remaining members of the Eternal Sun. You have to escape the floor by using Takagi's secret passage, but the button that activates it is in his office, which needs a key to unlock first. The problem is you're fighting an infinite spawning army of Eternal Sun goons, who are wearing the best armor, using assault rifles and flamethrowers, and give you no room to breathe. As they'll follow you around all over the level, offer little opportunities to heal yourself, and will kill any human shields you take almost instantly. It is just so frustrating trying to survive this section. Made worse as even after you do manage to activate the secret passage, you have to survive for an additional 4 minutes before the door opens. Why would you ever build a secret escape passage that way? The whole point is to get out as fast as you can before you get killed. And annoyingly, once you get through the passage, you still have to get through a gauntlet of heavily armed guys in a turret. Though thankfully, you have an easier chance to heal yourself by dragging someone into an unoccupied room. The level ends with the same cutscene you get at the beginning of the game, with Frank finishing off the Yakuza members in the building before letting himself get arrested. Things come full circle, as Molly realizes that Frank got himself arrested in the first place to get to Jigsaw. Also, turns out Soap was working with Frank all along, and was the one feeding him information all game. So what's Frank's plan to kill Jigsaw and get out of prison? I don't know how you knew this was gonna happen. Stay quiet and stay here with Molly. All hell's gonna break loose. They're gonna free all the inmates and escape in the confusion. What about you? I'm gonna kill all the inmates and escape in the confusion. Well, that's fairly straightforward. Thankfully, this final level is a lot easier than the Takagi building, as the bulk of enemies are made up of inmates who are rather squishy and go down fast. However, the level, and the game overall, ends on a rather tedious and kinda weak note, as we got one last shitty boss battle. Oh, oh, shit! 
Oh, that hurts. Sounds like the little pig is still alive, Castle. I'll fix that. Right after I'm done with you. John Saint. Or do you go by Jigsaw now? Despite the Iron Man armor Jigsaw is wearing, he still isn't as bad as the Russian. He'll float above the building, shooting down repulsor beams that will home in on Frank, and is completely invulnerable to damage. The only way you can hurt him is to fire at his jetpack, which isn't the easiest thing in the world to hit, as you have to wait for him to get close to you, avoid his beams, and run past him to shoot at it before he turns around. Easiest way to pull it off is to circle around this one little room on the roof. It'll block his shots and give you enough time to run under him and hit his jetpack. Once half his health is taken off, he'll crash onto the roof for the second phase of the fight. This is the more tedious part, as you're still unable to scratch him with your guns. Instead, you'll have to use explosives to chip away at his health and his armor. Explosives you can only pick up from Yakuza who show up to back up Jigsaw. Though there is this one little area off to the side where you can pick up some bombs too. So it's a long process of avoiding his attacks, throwing an explosive, detonating it before he runs away, killing his backup, rinse and repeat. The Russian fight is still worse in every single way, but this final Jigsaw fight was a really boring 20 minutes. After finally dropping his ass, we're treated to one last scene. Hey, how about a little help here, please? So, uh, what are you gonna do with Jigsaw? Kill him. No, oh, please, don't do that. I'll catch so much shit. He's in police custody. Not yet, he isn't. Jigsaw! Chopper's here, Jigsaw! Release your hostage and you're free to go! You have my word! into your custody. And that was The Punisher. After the credits, we'll get a cutscene with the Kingpin and Bullseye, who apparently survived falling from several stories, with Fisk planning revenge on The Punisher and setting up a sequel that never came. Overall, I had a pretty good time with the game. As a huge fan of The Punisher, it's easy to see how much love and attention for the source material the devs included. Having Garth Ennis on board probably helped a lot too. The shooting was fun, the executions were pretty cool, and I liked all the little extras you can unlock. Also, the music was pretty solid too, and really reminded me a lot of the movie. That said, there really isn't much else there. The gameplay is very repetitive. Pretty much each level is a linear set piece, killing everyone in your way, interrogating them, and saving the occasional hostage. Sometimes you need to find a key to proceed, but that's about it. Maybe something like a traditional stealth mission where you can't get spotted, or shit, as cliche and overused as they are, a turret section could have kept things fresh. The bosses are easily my biggest gripe. They're either brain dead and simple like the tank, or stupidly frustrating like the Russian. Maybe if boss encounters were more about positioning, using stealth, or making good use of the environment to fight the boss, they could have been a lot more memorable and engaging. The Bushwhacker fight gets close to that idea, what with his weakness to light, but maybe instead of tossing flash grenades, you instead had to get him to stand on a certain spot before turning on a spotlight or something to blind him. A way to add a little bit of strategy to the fights instead of chasing them around or waiting for the right window of opportunity to hurt them. The Punisher is certainly a fun game, and a real love letter to fans of the character. But there really isn't much that's going to get you coming back to play. Average is really the best way to describe it. Not terrible by any means, but not really remarkable. That said, I think most of you would walk away feeling satisfied, even if you're not a big fan of Frank Castle. It's too bad it didn't get a follow-up. 
It would have been amazing to see what Volition could have done with the IP, especially after all the work they put into the first two Saints Row games. I know I'm always wishing for remasters and remakes of games that aren't available on current systems, but if we ever get a new Punisher game in the future, I'd hope whoever makes it takes the good from this game, fixes the bad, and creates a whole new and enjoyable experience for Frank Castle. And that's the video. Thanks for watching. Well, that was a nice change of pace. Don't get me wrong, I love covering the big open sandbox GTA-like games. Honestly, I had such a blast with Saints Row 2 and Chinatown Wars. But every now and then, it's nice to sit down and play something on a much simpler and smaller scale. It also made it easier to play and make a video while my life is consumed by Tears of the Kingdom. I kind of want to take a look at more superhero games in the future, like the Deadpool game, X2 Wolverine's Revenge, X-Men Origins Wolverine, and some more Spidey games. Let me know if you guys would be interested in seeing videos on any of those in the comments down below. And feel free to make some suggestions too. I already covered Spider-Man on the PS1 and kind of want to do a sequel Enter Electro someday. If you saw my recent poll, the next game I'm covering is Mafia. And while I was indecisive about tackling the original or the remake, I decided to just do both. Since a good chunk of my videos cover games from when I was a kid, it makes sense to cover the original version of Mafia and see if it still holds up. But since the Definitive Edition updated a lot and changed quite a few things, it warrants covering as well. Right now, the plan is to do both in one big video together. I have to think about my approach and the best way to compare them, but I'll work something out that doesn't make the video too bloated. And if it works out and everyone likes it, it could work as a good foundation for other games with vastly different original versions and remakes. Like Yakuza and Yakuza Kiwami, for instance. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Again, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like and comment down below. Did you play the Punisher game growing up? Did you enjoy it? Which live action version of the Punisher is your favorite? And if you're new to the channel, I'd love it if you subscribed. Check out the recommended video at the end and the playlists of my other videos. I'm Fuzzy Slippers, and I'll see you later. Peace.